Oh, good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome to New Light Church. Um, so first off, thanks for, for those that took our chairs downstairs last Sunday, um, and you noticed that they're back up here. Uh, so uh, if you see uh, Tony, tell him thank you, because uh, he actually was just single-handedly brought all these chairs back up uh, on Friday. So um, so save the deacon to tripped over to uh, get everything up. Oh, no, I dropped my pick. So if you could please rise as we begin our worship. Um, first off, uh, Make sure your smart device is turned off or put in do not disturb. And then uh, second, we are a church and we want to fulfill the greatest commandments. So church, uh, just repeat after me. We want to love who? Love God. Love who? Love others. And make what? Make disciples. Let's worship the Lord. Praise. 
to you only. Great are you, Lord. One more time.
Good morning, everyone. It's nice to see you all. And uh, it's time for offering. And I um, uh, hope you had a blessed week. Or um, even if it doesn't feel like it was a good week, hope that God was with you. So um, let's um, pray for the offering. And Lord, Father God, we just thank you so much once again for all you have done for us. And Lord, um, um, we really have um, a lot um, as we live in this country, and uh, sometimes we just really fail to see um, with a grateful heart for what you have given to us. And Lord, I just pray that you will also turn our hearts um, to be generous, to bless others around us, and especially um, 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 
be obedient to uh, your commands that uh, so we give to support the church and the ministries that uh, you uh, are pleased with. And um, Lord, I just pray that you will um, continue to help us and work in each one of our hearts um, to be more uh, closer to you and to uh, think and be more like you, Lord. And then we cannot do that alone, but uh, with your help, we can certainly get closer. And we just thank you once again, Lord, uh, for just how wonderful you are. And so grateful that you are um, our God and that you came to seek us. And we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. And um, our um, scripture reading today is in uh, 2 Samuel chapter 9. And once again, I'll read the white text, and you can read the yellow text. And I think the last verse is in blue, and we'll read it together. So David asked, is there anyone remaining from the family of Saul I can show kindness to for Jonathan's sake? So the king asked, is there anyone left of Saul's family that I can show the kindness of God to? Ziba said to the king, there is still Jonathan's son who was injured in both feet. The king asked him, where is he? Ziba answered the king, you'll find him in Lodibar at the house of Machir, son of Amia. So King David had him brought from the house of Makir, son of Amiel in Lodabar. Mephishbosheth, son of Jonathan, son of Saul, came to David, fell face down, and paid homage. David said, Mephishbosheth, I am your servant. He replied, Don't be afraid, David said to him. Since I intend to show you kindness for the sake of your father, Jonathan, I will restore to you all your grandfather Saul's fields, and you will always eat meals at my table. The fish paid homage and said, What is your servant that you take an interest in a dead dog like me? Then the king summoned Saul's attendant, Ziba, and said to him, I have given to your master's grandson all that belong to Saul and his family. You, your sons, and your servants are to work the ground for him, and you are to bring in the cross so your master's grandson will have food to eat. But Mephishbosheth, your master's grandson, is always to eat at my table. Now Ziba had 15 sons and 20 servants. Ziba said to the king, your servant will do all my lord the king commands. So Mashiba sat ate at David's table just like one of the king's sons. Mephishbosheth had a young son whose name was Micah. All those living in Ziba's house were Mephishbosheth's servants. Let's read together. However, Meshiboseth lived in Jerusalem because he always ate at the king's table. His feet had been injured. And uh, Kyle will give a mini sermon to the younger ones. All right. Well, what did everyone know? You scare him off, Isaac. So, have you heard the story before, Isaac? Yeah. So, can you say Meshiboseth 10 times faster? I, I can't, so if you could, it would be pretty impressive. So, um, who is Mephishbosheth? Who is he related to? Jonathan. Jonathan? Yeah. Yep. Yeah. So, back in the day, when you became a king, normally it was your kids, your blood, that would become king after you, right? So, if you were a king, your son would become king, right? Et cetera, et cetera. Now, let's say that there is an enemy king that comes to over here. I'm going to use Dennis. Dennis becomes king, and he hears that there is a progeny in the line of Isaac. What do you think is going to happen? Go kill off your entire family. Because we can't have a civil war going on. Maybe someone doesn't like the way that Dennis is, does his kingship. So they're like, hey, find that kid of Isaac, and 
will make him king instead because his dad was a king, right? And so basically, Mephibosheth, when David called him, do you think he was excited or really nervous? Yes, extremely. Just like whenever you hear your mom or anyone that you are close to say, hey, we need to talk, right? It sends shivers down your spine. And so, <laughs> this is how he felt. But why did David want to talk to Mephibosheth? Because uh, he had promised to Jonathan. Yes. Were Jonathan and David close? Yeah. yeah, they're like brothers, right? They loved each other. And in fact, David even said that his relationship with Jonathan, his brotherhood he had with him, was better than even having a wife, which is pretty crazy. And so, what ended up happening is David called him Mephishbosheth, and Mephishbosheth throws himself at David's feet, and he says, what can I do for you, my king? Now, another important thing is, was there anything wrong with Mephishbosheth? Yeah, do you remember how, do you know how that happened? So back in 2 Samuel chapter four, we find out that there's a civil war going on in Israel, David on one side and Saul's kid on the other, his uncle. His uncle is killed by assassins and so his nanny just runs him and picks him up and starts to run out of the city thinking that they're gonna be killed. And so he's five when this happens. And so when you're five, you're like bigger than a toddler but you can't run fast yet, right? and you're too big to really hold. So you're like, it's awkward in between. So basically as the nanny picked him up to run, she tripped over a root or tripped on a brick or something and fell down and he broke his ankles and it basically made, meant he could never walk really well again. He needed crutches for the rest of his life. Now, if you think about it back then, do you think that was gonna be an easy thing to deal with or a hard thing? Hard. Yeah, right? What do they do? Well, they work the fields. It's hard to work the field when you can't walk, isn't it? <laughs> and so what he has to do is rely on others' generosity. And so when David calls them in, he's like, all of the land of your grandpa Saul is yours, which is incredible. And then he says, and you'll never leave my palace. You'll eat at my table. Now we don't have like a modern equivalent of this, but imagine if you got to meet the president, that'd be pretty cool. You know, President Biden came in and said, hey, Isaac, are you gonna eat dinner with me every single day? It'd be pretty cool, right? It's a big honor, because who normally eats with important people, like the kings? His kids, maybe the generals, maybe a warrior or a secretary of state, you know? But most people don't get that honor, right? And so, does Mephishbosheth deserve this? No. He should be killed by what everyone else would tell David. But David said, no, I'm gonna, honor him and give him a place at my table. So what does the story tell us? There's one word that I want you to remember. It's a Hebrew word. You might have heard it before. Hesed. H-E-S-E-D. It means love, but it means more than that because in English, you love pizza, I love pizza. You love cheese pizza, I love sausage pizza, right? It, it's kind of watered down. But it means faithful love or loving kindness or merciful love, right? It's all of the good things of love. Like when you mess up and you know that your parents aren't gonna kick you out of the house because they love you, right? It's a love that has compassion and grace and kindness and all of these things that you would want love to be. And so David, he showed Mephishbosheth has said, even though he doesn't deserve it, he should be killed. He's the enemy's son. He could start a civil war over this, right? And so, we are both David and Mephishbosheth in this story. Why? Last week, we talked about how David got loving kindness from God. God gave him a, a covenant, right? He said, you'll always be king, your kids will always be king. That was God showing said to David. So David received said. Now David is a king. No one can tell him anything. He's the big, the big tiger on, on the mountaintop. I just made that up, it sounds weird. <laughs> so he's the, he's the big man in camp. No one can tell him anything. So if David wanted to kill Mephishbosheth, he could really easily, right? Didn't even have to go out there, just send a soldier, watch out, he did. But David has been given said, so now he shows said. Mephishbosheth is now given a grace that he does not deserve because David has been given grace he doesn't deserve. And so that's what we want to take away. 
If you have the opportunity to give someone grace they don't deserve, you should give it. If you're given grace you don't deserve, you should accept it. Because that's who we want to be as people of God. People of Hesed. Say it, say it with me. Hesed. Hesed. Yeah, people of Hesed. That is your lesson today. Let's pray. Father, we come before you, and I pray that I would be able to speak everything that needs to be spoken, that I would not speak what needs to not be spoken, and that we would be just moved by the incredible action of you through your people in this story. And Lord, may we learn from David and Mephishbosheth uh, how to respond to grace and mercy. In your name we pray. Amen. You know, one of the most interesting things, I wonder if it will play. Yes. <laughs> um, I, I love this, this gift because it's uh, just like, let me love you. Um, and the reason I say this is because one of the most interesting interactions we have is how do people respond to positive emotions, like love, grace, and mercy. I think all of us, if I pulled the room, would say something like, we want people to have empathy and kindness towards us. However, maybe this is just me. When it comes to getting those positive things, it's kind of uncomfortable. When someone comes up and says, that was the greatest sermon I've ever heard, I'm not sure if I should be like, thank you so much, or be like, no, it's all God, right? It's, it's difficult for me to deal with nice things given to me. Now, if you come up and say, that's the worst sermon I've ever heard in my life, that would be easier for me to deal with because, all right, well, that's negative. I can shift through why you think it's negative and find probably some nugget of truth in there. It's been hard for me when someone challenges me to love better or to love myself better in many ways. When I fall short before Tabitha and I don't deserve grace, but she gives it most of the time. This great grace, this colossal kindness, it, it's hard to accept sometimes. While it's much preferable to the alternative of sleeping on the couch, sometimes sleeping on the couch is easier to deal with eter internally. And so when we look at our own lives and we look at the lives of people in Scripture, we need to understand that while we might have failed before God or before others, we need to accept that kindness. We have to get to a point where we can realize that we can never out God's grace, his colossal kindness, and his immense mercy. Because if we're honest with ourselves, we don't really want justice, even though it might be easier for us to accept, because we know we're guilty. And we know that we need grace to get us out of the mess that we put ourselves in. So if I ask you a positive statement, how do you feel? Like one of the statements that, uh, that I've been hearing from Tabitha, she's gone through uh, her own journey of self-healing from anxiety, is, I choose to be kind to myself. And then she'll make me say it about myself, and it's like, eh, I, I choose to be eh, not kind. It, there we go. I can say it that way. Right? It, it's almost like it's more difficult for me to just get it out. I know it's cognitively true that I should be kind to myself and accept kindness, but there's something within me that just doesn't like it. It's like, yes, negative, good, positive, bad. And I say this because it reflects how our relationship with God is. I know cognitively that God is kind to me and that I should be kind to others. I can deal with that. However, kind to myself? Eh, maybe not. And what happens when we put another standard on ourselves? We say we're not in the same camp as others, so we, we end up being substantially harsher on ourselves. So what do we do with this? Is this right? Should we be harsher on ourselves? I think it's part about being human. 
It's that we need to address our ability or perhaps our inability to deal with ourselves and others in a way that God wants us to. So what does this have to do with the story we just read? In our story, we're back in the life of David and we see great mercy, great meekness, and great malice. All of these things stem from the same place, from the same action, and the same person. King David's interaction with God, his interaction with Mephishbosheth, and his interaction with Ziba. And so as we look through these three men, let's see what we can learn. David is just coming off the high of what we talked about last time. He was given this am amazing, immediate covenant of grace and mercy from God that he would have a line for all of his life and for eternity. And this is where Jesus comes from, the line of David. It is the line of the Messiah. So David, experiencing this great mercy and kindness of God, utterly dismantles his pre-existing notions of God and how a relationship with God works. It's no longer transactional. Well, I've done a lot of good things, God. I've killed a lot of your enemies, God. I've done all the things you want me, God. Are, so I'm going to build you a house, a temple now, God. And God said, no, I'm going to bless you before you could ever think of blessing me. So what does David do after experiencing the great mercy of God? He turns and thinks upon his past life. The past covenant promises he's made with not simply Jonathan, but also Saul. Jonathan and David were best friends, brothers, men that loved the Lord with the same incredible zeal. They were people that both chafed after God and desired the accountability and encouragement from each other as they followed God. Which is also a great reminder of us to try to find those relationships of people that will push us and keep us accountable of our own sin and failures as we follow God, but also that they would encourage us and exhort us to overcome those sins and to follow God closer each day. And so these are the words that were given between Jonathan and David in 1 Samuel chapter 20. If I continue to live, show me kindness from the Lord. This is I, is Jonathan. But if I die, don't ever withdraw your kindness from my household, not even when the Lord cuts off every one of David's enemies from the face of the earth. Well, that's a great promise between people that love each other as brothers. But it's not simply Jonathan. David also gave the same promise to Saul in 1 Samuel chapter 24. When Saul is chasing David, trying to kill him and wipe him off the face of the earth, David is in the cave where Saul goes to relieve himself, and he cuts off a piece of his cloak, his tunic, and comes out, and they have this discussion. And this is what Saul says at the end of that interaction. Now I know for certain you will be king. The kingdom of Israel will be established in your hand. Therefore swear to me by the Lord that you will not cut off my descendants or wipe, off, wipe out my name from my father's family. And so David swore to Saul. And then Saul went back home, and David and his men went up to the stronghold. Why is this important? It shows a great deal of David's character. His character, his work in his life. It shows that while Saul viewed David as a threat to the throne of Israel, David never viewed Saul as an enemy. We even see in that same chapter in 1 Samuel 24, David calls Saul his father. Secondly, it sets up the important contrast of how David works in contra to the entire known world at that time. In 1 Samuel 20, why does Saul want to kill David? Because while David is alive, his kingship is at risk. So what is the norm for a newly important king, a newly appointed king from a different bloodline to do? Well, regicide. Eradicate every living member of the line prior to the new king. Everyone that is related to Saul, his daughters, his sons, his grandkids, his great-grandkids, anyone that has any claim to Saul in any way, shape, or form should be eliminated because otherwise civil war can ensue. So what David's words say is, who may I show kindness to? This is the same question, at least on the front end, 
that people would ask. The king comes to power, and they call the advisors, and they say, are there any living people related to the prior king? But David says, who I may show kindness to, these people are thinking who I may end the lives of, so that there's no threat to my kingdom. His motive is very different. Notice here in 2 Samuel chapter 9, verse 3, so the king asked, is there anyone left of Saul's family that I can show the kindness of God to? And so Ziba, who was a servant of Saul, was brought into the picture. Well, there's still Jonathan's son who's injured in both eat. Really, this is central to the entire story. This verse 3, David is not seeking simply to show kindness from his own life, or even kindness of Jonathan. No, this is rooted in David's experience with God's kindness just two chapters ago when he is the Davidic con- covenant given to him. And so the kindness of God so changes and radically transforms David that he would never think of breaking his covenant with Jonathan. He would never think of forsaking the covenant with Saul. It has changed his life. And so it brings us to that word that I mentioned to Isaac just a bit ago, has said. It is a supernatural love, it is covenant faithfulness, it is something that God says himself is a key aspect of his character. And so how much time has passed between the promise given to Jonathan and David? At least 15 years, maybe up to 20 years. That's a long time, 15 to 20 years. That's a whole lot of life to have happened. David was on the run. David worked for the Philistines. David has gone through a civil war. David is now the king, unified, the height of his rule. But it also shows us something interesting, that we should really take our promises quite seriously. As I was preparing for the sermon this week, I came across this quote, a believer's sacred promise or covenant in the past will direct and determine what fidelity looks like in the present. What does this mean? Basically, if we make promises, particularly when we invoke God's name, we better be sure that we honor them. We can't be people that are wishy-washy in our promises because aren't there promises that we don't really want to keep? When we make a plan with a friend, but then a closer friend invites us to do something that would be more fun that we really want to do, We cancel our initial plan, maybe. There's a guy growing up in my church um, named Mike Walsh. He's an incredible drummer, and he was actually on many albums uh, as a jazz drummer. Uh, He was so good that he was offered one of the Blue Men Group jobs as, you know, the blue people that play the drums at the shows. But he declined. And so one Saturday, as he's getting ready for a church the next day, because he's on worship team as a drummer, He gets a call from the friend in the music industry and says, hey, Ted Nugent is playing tomorrow in Milwaukee, and they need a drummer. What do you think Mike said? Well, that's an awesome opportunity. But Mike, with no hesitation, immediately says, sorry, but I'm playing at church tomorrow. I can't make it. How many of us in Mike's shoes would make the same decision? You're turning down playing one of the biggest names in rock and roll and probably a pretty decent paycheck. For just one Sunday, you're there every other Sunday. You're always playing drum for the church. It's a one-time thing. I'm at church every week. This one week doesn't matter. So why did Mike do this? He wanted to honor God over the praise of men because he gave his word to the worship pastor and also by implication to the rest of the church and congregation that he would use those skills to honor God on that Sunday. And therefore, that took priority. Was it costly? Absolutely. It cost him a great opportunity. Was it worth it? Absolutely. Jim Elliott, one of the great martyred missionaries, said it this way, he is no fool who gives up what he cannot keep to gain what he cannot lose. He is no fool who gives up what he cannot keep to gain what he cannot lose. And so David goes against the entire grain of that day and age. And instead of going to eliminate the line of Saul, he seeks to give Saul family supernatural covenant faithfulness love that is said. 
So the second main person in their story, the crippled son of Jonathan, Mephibosheth. So David finds a servant of Saul named Ziba, who we will go to in a moment, and find out through him that the son of Jonathan still lives, but he's injured in both feet. Let's put ourselves in the place of Mephibosheth. He's five years old when his uncle, who was a stand-in for Saul after his death, was assassinated. His nanny comes in running as the news reaches their ears and scoops him up, running away for their lives. And being five, you know, maybe a couple five years old, old kindergarten age kids, they're too small to run fast with adults and they're really too big to carry for any long distance. And so as she's running with him, she loses her balance, trips and falls some way, shape or form. And he falls and breaks both his ankles so that they're never really healed ever again. And so he's labeled lame. He escapes with his life, but he would be affected the rest of his life. Even his name is changed. In the parallel account of the genealogy, he is called Meribal, which means he that resists Baal. Isn't that fitting for the royal lineage of Saul? who serves Yahweh, of course, they would resist Baal. But now his name is Mephishbosheth. It means mouth of shame. No longer one who would contend against Baal, but one who is full of shame. And so he escaped to this place named Lodabar, which literally means nothing good, a bit of a wild west town out in the boonies. And they find an interesting man named Makir takes care of him. And we'll see his name pop up later in the story of David. But Ziba tracks him down and gets a summoning from David, the new king. And so, as I said, Isaac, you all know that feeling when your significant other or maybe your parents say, hey, we need to talk. Immediate, you're like, why did you phrase it like that? Especially if it's not like something that's like do or die. And you're like, hey, we need to talk. And you're like, what did I do? And you start recounting everything that you've done in like the last like week. Like, what, was it because I ordered Arby's instead of KFC for dinner? Was it, you know, what was it? And my entire body goes into shock and the fight, fight, or fleet, freeze response. And I'm sure that's similar to how he would have reacted. But there's also another wrinkle here. In verse 12, we're told he has a small son named Micah. And so if David is going to start purging the line of Saul, as most kings would, his son would also be at risk. So what does Mephishbosheth do? He shows up as David's palace is summoned, and before David does anything, he falls face down and pays homage. You can imagine how awkward that would be. He's walking with, with crutches, maybe something like this. He can't really get down gingerly probably falling to his knees, throwing his face as low as it can go at David's feet, hoping that he will walk out alive. And so David does insanity. Mephishbosheth, I am your servant. I restore all the land of your grandpa to you, the land of Saul. What? You restoring me the land, my grandpa? But aren't you worried I'll rise up and start a revolt or a civil war? Ziba, take care of the land. Now, Mephishbosheth, not only that, you will be eating at my table every single day while I am king. Every single day you will be with me, eating the choice food. You no longer have to worry about how you're going to survive. You no longer have to worry if I'm going to end your life. No. You will be taken care of as a prince. So how did Mephishbosheth respond? Who am I that you would take interest in a dead dog like me? He was in utter awe to the said that David gave him. He is low on the ground at the feet of David, powerless to do anything. If David wants to wipe him off and his son off the earth, nothing can stop him. And at that moment, he received great unmerited said. He responds, in fact, with the same phrase that David uses of himself when his grandpa Saul was chasing him down in 1 Samuel chapter 24. Who has the king of Israel come after? Who are you chasing after? A dead dog? A single flea? 
This is not so much self-abasement as Mephishbosheth knowing he had nothing to offer and he is utterly at the mercy of the king. And so Mephishbosheth gets the kindness of God through the kindness of David instead of what he was expecting. I think it's quite interesting to read this story in our modern understanding of disabilities. I don't know if you have any friends or family with disability, whether they be in a wheelchair or whether it be some sort of other physical or cognitive disability. But when you are on government care, when you're on food stamps and you're on disability, it sucks. One of my good friends was in a terrible motorcycle crash a number of years ago, and it shattered his back, and so now he has a metal rod for back that, and of course, doesn't work very well because it's a metal rod and metal doesn't bend very well. And, uh, and so he lost his ability to work. He was a mechanic beforehand. He can't bend over the car, but it'll make his back seize up. And so he's been, he had on disability. And before he received a settlement from the company that had the truck hit him on the motorcycle, uh, he was barely surviving. He was living at home with his parents, and oftentimes he couldn't even afford the gas to go out and get groceries or do anything on his own. And this, this is in our modern times where we have all the legal protections and all the government programs to help those, but in many ways they're still treated as second-class citizens. So if we rewind the clock by about 3,000 years, you can imagine a fishbowl Seth is in much, much worse straits. Because it's easy for us to give mercy to those that can help us and bless us. But what about those that are only a drain? Mephishbosheth can't ever work the field. Ziba is to take care of it. His son Micah will take it up. And Mephishbosheth will never be able to be a productive member of society. Especially in a society of agricultural. Where you go out and you work the field. And it's not like you can go over to Jen and order a fancy tractor that does the driving for all of you. No, Mephishbosheth had to walk behind the oxen or the donkeys or the horses as they plow the fields. So by a worldly standard, there is no reason for David to show any kindness to this man. He is nothing but trouble. Whether it be a political pawn in a coup, whether it be a drain on the king's resources to feed him at the table, whatever it is, by any worldly standard, he is not worthy of getting mercy too. There's a similar story when we turn to the New Testament in John chapter 9 where there is a man born blind and you think of all the struggle that his family went through. He couldn't learn to read because he's blind. He couldn't really walk very well because he's blind, right? All of these things that come with being born with a child that has disabilities. And Jesus is asked this question not by the Pharisees or by the Sadducees or by the tax collectors or by the lawyers, but by his disciples. And in John chapter 9, this is the word that the apostles utter. Who sinned, this man or his parents? The initial question would not ask by anyone other than the closest followers of Jesus. And can we also fall into the same sort of pit and judge people by their social usefulness rather than their worth of simply being in the image of God? The early church understood this quite well. They would go dumpster diving for babies that were often abandoned for various reasons. And the rates of children being abandoned in the early church was anywhere from 20 to 40 percent throughout the Roman Empire and even into Europe. Now, to be fair, others would rescue children that were not Christian. But it was the churches and the Christians who started doing even more. They would fundraise among themselves so they could have funds to help raise these children. They were the, the church was the first one to open up orphanages to help them grow up. And now they knew the innate worth of these children. And they didn't view them as purely contributors to society. The modern church has much of the same heart. In our current society, if you get into a debate about abortion and you say that you're pro-life, you'll often hear something said like this. Well, Christians or pro-lifers, they only care about kids in the womb, not after they're born. Well, let me tell you the the lie. Because here are some of the information about adoption. 
people adopting kids that are not their own, and this doesn't even include all of the foster system. In a Barna study, they found these stats about the current church, and this was done in 2019. 77% of the church says that we should adopt. Those that follow through of it, well, 2% of our non-religious counterparts in our society adopt. That goes up to 5% if you are a practicing Christian of some type, 6% if you are Catholic, and all the way up to 10% if you are evangelical. And then on top of that, what about the churches when they have members that are adopting? 43% of those saying adopting, they say that they have the church help in some way, whether it be 18% helping with the finances of adopting, 25% saying with the travel cost of adoption, or 41% saying that they help with household tasks during the adoption process. These are people that are showing said to the lowest of society by many standards. These are kids that for one reason or another are no longer desired by their parents or unable to be kept by their parents. And so when the church steps in, they show that they are living the way that God wants us to live, that we are living self-sacrificially. It might look like Mike saying no to Ted Nugent, and so you can be on worship team the next Sunday. It might look like going and adopting people that are at risk or need help. It might look like uh, many of you know Alan, who adopted his daughter Evie, who has special needs, and so Alan adopted her because of her special needs. It might be like my pastor when I was in Chicago, Sergei, who had a daughter with Down syndrome when he was a missionary in the Ukraine, and so they came back to the States for medical care, and then they went back to the Ukraine to adopt another Down syndrome daughter because they knew no one would adopt her otherwise. This type of action shows that God has taken root in our hearts and he changes what we do. So not only does Mephishbosheth give back the land of his grandpa, but he sits at the king table. An incredibly rare opportunity, usually only the general, the best warrior, and the princes and the princesses do this. There's no modern equivalent to this incredible honor. Chuck Swindoll wrote this excerpt. I think it's quite helpful. Gold and silver fixtures held the flaming torches that lined that palace walls. Lofty hand-carved wooden ceiling crowned each spacious room, including the banquet hall where David and his family gathered for their evening meals. In one chair sat the tanned, handsome Absalom with his long, raven-black locks of hair. Next to him, his beautiful sister Tamar, Across from her sat the young and brilliant Solomon. And at supper time, and the call had gone out to all the family to gather around the table as David and the dad scanned the room to make sure all the kids are present. He notices that one is missing. It isn't long before everyone can hear the sound they've come to be accustomed to by now. Clump, scrape, clump, scrape. Echoes from the hallways into the dining room. Clump, scrape, clump, scrape. Finally, a young man appears and slowly shuffles to his place. It's Mephishbosheth, of course, seated now at the king's table along with the other members of the king's family. And once seated, the tablecloth of grace covers his feet. And we are reassured of the king's grace as we read Mephishbosheth ate at David's table as one of the king's son. And although he had nothing to offer David, the king lavished on him great honor. David no, made no distinction between Absalom and Tamar and Solomon and Mephishbosheth. When grace abounds, that's what happens. Favor is extended to the undeserving, which cannot be earned or repaid. This is why we call it amazing. Can you imagine this change from Nothingville to the palace? From expecting death to experiencing the delicacies of the palace? Mephishbosheth accepted the grace that David gave because he needed it and he had nothing to do, to go against it. There's also one incredible part of this story that we might overlook so easily. You notice that throughout this chapter, at the beginning, it's the king. Then when Ziba comes in, it's King David. But when Jonathan's son 
Mephishbosheth, who has nothing to offer anyone, comes in. It is now simply David. Because David is showing him grace as an equal, as a peer, as one who looks at Mephishbosheth and sees his friend Jonathan in his face, perhaps sees him in his stature, wondering what would Mephishbosheth be like if his legs were full and, and able to do everything they needed to do. And as he sees his best friend, son, in front of him, he is no longer King David. He's no longer the king. He is simply David. What an incredible act of mercy David gave. We see that David had great grace to lavish. And so he does. And Mephishbosheth responded to that great grace with meekness and joy. But there is another who did not respond in the same way to this experience, and that is Ziba, who responded with malice. Because Ziba was one of Saul's servants, perhaps one of the senior servants, and it seems he knows where Mephishbosheth is quite easily. He's called into the king's palace. He doesn't ask for time to go find it. He's like, oh, I know where this guy is. So what else do we know about Ziba? Well, don't name your children Ziba. He's not a good guy. He quickly gives up the whereabouts of his master's son so swiftly he hears David say, I want to show God kindness to Saul's house, but look, we all know politicians. We all know that they will say anything in order to get what they want. So it would be rightfully for him to assume that although he's saying, I am wanting to show God kindness, it is just a front in order to eliminate any threat to the throne. I think Ziba thinks he was going to be rewarded, but all he got was to become the farmhand. But many years later, when David is fleeing from his son's coup, Mephishbosheth is getting ready to leave with David, to leave the town, to leave the palace. And Ziba sees an opportunity and runs off with the donkeys. And when David asked, where is Mephishbosheth? Ziba just said, oh, he's hoping you die. He's hoping that his father's fortunes will be restored to him through your son. Utter and complete hogwash. What a jerk. He takes advantage of this cripple. And so David gives all that land that he gave to Mephishbosheth to Ziba. Eventually, the civil war seeds and David returns. And there waiting for David is Mephishbosheth. In 2 Samuel chapter 19, we read this. Mephishbosheth, Saul's grandson, also went down to meet the king. He had not taken care of his feet, trimmed his mustache, or washed his clothes from the day the king left until the day he returned safely. What does that mean? It means he was mourning. He was deeply grieved that he couldn't go with David. In a place that wore open-toed shoes everywhere, they wore sandals everywhere, to not take care of your feet, especially when your feet are broken like his, it's a big deal. And so when they came to Jerusalem to meet the king, the king asked him, Mephishbosheth, why didn't you come with me? My lord, the king, he replied, my servant Ziba betrayed me. Actually, your servant said, I'll saddle the donkey for myself so that I might ride it and go with the king for your servant's lame. Ziba slandered your servant to my lord, the king. But my lord, the king is like an angel of God, so do whatever you think is best. For my entire family, my grandpa's entire family deserves death for my lord, the king. But you set your servant among those who eat at your table. So what further right do I have to keep making appeal to the king? Mephishbosheth is saying, you showed me the grace I did not deserve. I deserve death. You gave me a lavish life that I could have never given myself. The king said to him, why keep speaking on these matters? I declare that you and Ziba are to divide the land. And Mephishbosheth said to the king, instead, since my lord the king had come back to his palace safely, let Ziba take it all. Ziba wanted to control how grace was given. He wanted his parameters set on it. 
Ah, that grace thing seemed pretty fun and pretty good. I want it, but on my terms. Because this shows us something incredible. Mercy is for the weak. If we pretend to be better and braver and more holy than we are, we are not wanting mercy, but we want a reward. David had great mercy given to him, and so he gave great mercy. Bishbutha had great mercy, and he accepted it. And then he even chose David's over his entire land. Ziba had great mercy given to him, but he tried to control the outflow of it. There's so much we could talk about in this message, and, and we have, but I want to boil down our message to one word, as I said earlier. Has said. Has said. Say it with me. Has said. You'll find this word throughout the pages of Scripture. From how Jesus or how God responds to the golden calf worshippers, to throughout the book of Ruth, throughout God giving people grace when they don't deserve it. It is a key attribute of who God is. And I hope that as you read scripture, you will read it with the eyes of a God who is full of hesed, that is loving kindness. And so the people of God must be able to receive loving mercy and extend loving mercy. So if you walk away with one thing, it is hesed. Lock that in your brain and keep it. And if you walk away with one A, it is we as the people of God must be willing to receive God's loving mercy and extend loving mercy. It reminds us that Hesed is for the weak. Jesse Ventura, the famous wrestler and the governor of Minnesota, said this, Christianity is a crutch for the weak-minded people who need strength in numbers. You know, he's not entirely wrong. We can't do this life on our own. We can't follow Jesus alone either. That is why our brothers and sisters at church are so important. We all help each other finish the race well. We are, number one, realizing we are weak, that we need God's power. God's power is what we need. It's what Paul says in 2 Corinthians chapter 12. But God said to me, my grace is sufficient for you. My power is perfected in weakness. Therefore, I, Paul, will most gladly boast all the more about my weakness so that Christ's power may reside in me. So I take pleasure in weakness, insults, hardship, persecutions, and in difficulties for the sake of Christ. For when I am weak, then I am strong. Have you ever thought that in your weakest times, it is the time that you are most exalting God? When we most need God because of our weakness, that it is a time that we are most exalting God. Not when we are strong and we're like, well, I don't need God's help. I can do this by my own skill set. We are much like Mephishbosheth, that we need the grace of God. We are thrown at the feet of Jesus, knowing we don't deserve grace, but in our weakness, it is the only thing that can make us whole. So what is has said like? The mercy is a mercy that does not throw away the weak. It welcomes them when they have nothing to offer. How we respond has said matters because only by meekly and humbly accepting it does it offer us the salvation that we desperately need. Weakness is the only way to grace. And so some people just can't accept it. They can't bear that the image we work so hard to show off is worth nothing before God. They can't handle that the uneducated homeless man is at the same level of need as their doctorate level, gated community, private, plain self. Because we are all in the same place as Mephishbosheth was before David in our relationship to God. And we are all at the same place of being able to receive that incredible grace. Not because we are worthy, not because we are done something of merit, but because we have nothing to offer but ourselves, and we throw ourselves on the grace of Christ. So what does Hesed do? 
It transforms our lives. And like David, we turn and we lavish it out when we have the chance. Maybe when we've had bad bosses. My brother will call me and tell me oftentimes about how work's going and and talking about life. And, And so one of the things that will come up is, oh, my boss was so hard today. Like, he's just like so agitated all day, blah, you know, and on and on and on. Anyone else ever have a boss like that? I have. So my brother, who is also a Christian, and has grown up in the church, and he knows who God is, I turn and I say, well, Cam, have you given your boss grace? Do you know what's causing this struggle with him? Did he get in the car wreck on the way to church? Does his grandma have cancer? Is he going through a difficult time in his marriage? You don't know any of this, Cam. Like, he hasn't told you this. So you need to turn around and give grace to your boss. Give his said to your boss. And sure, he might not deserve it. He might be acting like a, like a jerk. But if he were deserving of it, then it wouldn't be grace, would it? His said makes us alive when we're as good as dead men and places us in an incredible place, the table of royalty in heaven. In Ephesians chapter 2, we too all previously lived among them in our fleshly desires, carrying out the inclinations of our flesh and thoughts. And we were by nature children under wrath as others were also. But God, who is rich in mercy, because of his great love he had for us, what does that sound like? Has said, made us alive with Christ even though we were dead in our trespasses. You are saved by grace. He raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavens in Christ Jesus so that in the coming ages he might display the immeasurable riches of his grace through his kindness in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. Has said changes us. It changes us to trust and depend on God. It changes us to find our true joy and our contentment in him. Now, this isn't simply a a feel-good, never stand up for the right thing type of thing. But it changes the motivations of our hearts from ourselves and our kingdoms and our fights in order to represent Christ. It takes away the me from the center and it places Christ there. So as we look at the story, we have these three men. And they tell us how we might deal with the mercy of God. David is given great grace by God, and therefore he turns around and he shows great grace. And in a few chapters, he will be given that great grace right back. And in fact, one of the interesting things is that when David is on the run from his son and the coup, and they are on the run, it is the same man who was taking care of Mephishbosheth out in Lodabar that then sends a wealth of resources to David. In many ways, it's that David has shown, has said to Mephishbosheth, and so now this man is paying back the favor. And then David will even get more has said from God in his affair with Bathsheba. He deserved to be struck down and killed, but he wasn't. Mephishbosheth has given great grace, and so he accepts it, knowing that he has nothing to offer. He has no place of power like the king. He has no leverage against the king. He can only accept it. And we should as well. And Ziba, well, Ziba was given great grace as well to work this great plot of land. He would have basically, hey, here's a lottery, but I need you to be the financial advisor, perhaps in modern terms. And all Ziba wanted was he coveted that money for himself. He coveted those resources for himself. He was given the opportunity to take care of a large plot of land, which was equal to money back then, and he tried to control it and make it his. Who do you want to be? We should all strive to be like David and strive to be like Mephishbosheth. We have to be on guard that we are not like Ziba. Thomas Adams said this, He that demands mercy and shows none ruins the bridge over he himself must run. He that demands mercy and shows none ruins the bridge over he himself must run. And so as we are people of said loving kindness, we must be able to receive loving mercy and extend it. Let us pray. Father, I come before you and ask that you would be with us. We need you today, Lord. It is so easy to get caught up in the wrong things or to make good things into the greatest thing. 
Lord, let us keep you number one in our life. And Lord, as we come across people that are difficult to deal with, maybe drive us up a wall, may we give them said, even when they don't deserve it, because without the lack of deserving, it's not said. It's easy to love our family and those that are easy to get along with us. But let us live out your said. Let us live it out radically so that people might see the difference and point at us and be like, that's what Christ followers are like. That's so crazy. How can you do that? It cost you so much. How can you do that? Lord, I just pray that you would be with everyone here today and that they would experience your loving kindness, your said in a real way. And if they've not experienced a relationship with you, the salvation that comes, may they experience that today. May they come to you and ask for forgiveness of their sins, and may they live for you for the rest of their lives. In your name we pray. Amen. Yeah, what a great message to remember, right? Um, I think mercy is needed everywhere all the time. And it's not easy to give mercy sometimes, but um, I think with God's help, so hopefully we can all receive and give. So um, there's an announcement. Uh, announcement is that there's deacons meeting today um, at, at 2 o'clock, so if you have something that you want to uh, bring up to the deacons, uh, feel free to let uh, Jen or Kyle knows. And um, we also have a survey that we need your help to fill out. Do we have this? Uh, I think oh, I we didn't, have a. You know, I forgot to add it this morning. <laughs> okay. Well, we were going to have this. Uh, uh, It'll QR be in the code. email uh, later today. Okay. So. Kyle will send an email out. There's a QR code that you can. Use that, you know, uh, to do your survey. Or Jen has a paper survey. If you prefer the paper survey, uh, yes. let us know. So, or if you find, or if you find me or Jen, we also have the QR code uh, on our phone, so we can, you can scan it from there too. Very so, much. Yeah. So whatever that works for you, that makes it easier for you. And Paul Yang, he will be conducting IT and sound system training. Uh, 1 30 uh, in the sanctuary right here uh, that's today right no, that's February 4th, oh, oh <laughs> February 4th so not today no, no, <laughs> okay no problem I wasn't sure so that's not today but we will be having one next week um, okay that's next week so next week at 1 30 so if you are interested in serving on that or are serving on that uh, please, we encourage, strongly encourage you to come and attend the training. It'll be very helpful for you. Um, and uh, the sanctuary chair, sanctuary chair um, as you can see, we were supposed to get new chairs, but the delivery was um, kind of delayed. Uh, so uh, the original day was canceled, So, but a new day will be announced. So we're not sure when it's going to arrive, so just bear with us for now. And um, so volunteers for kitchen duty is needed for March. Please let Jen know if you can uh, help. So, um, and then we also have a Middle Eastern medical mission to Lebanon and Jordan. That's going to take place in April, April 13 to the 26th. And please contact Ling if you are interested in going. And if you don't know who Ling is, you can find one of us. We'll let you know. And um, youth are going to Challenge Conference first week of July in Kansas City, Missouri. Please let Kyle know if you like to go and or any other friends, people you know who would be interested. So um, people who have gone and uh, really enjoyed it. It's a great uh, youth conference. Um, so uh, please rise for um, worship. Oh, one more, I guess. Yeah, I, I added this one. Back. Okay, there's uh, a... So we have our Chinese New Year uh, uh, celebration or uh, Lantern Festival celebration. Uh, that's coming up the last Saturday, last Saturday in February. Um, so uh, please be thinking about maybe if there's any songs you want to sing uh, or any uh, skit you want to do, uh, just so that we could maybe have something from the EM side. Um, and so talk to me or to Jen uh, if you have ideas or anything that you want to do. 
uh, or Guinevere just want to do yellow again with all the people. So, um, yes, that's all about the Chinese New Year. So. All right, please rise for uh, worship. <laughs>
the Lord. He prepared a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Only goodness and faithfulness and faithful love will pursue me all the days of my life. And I will dwell in the house of the Lord as long as I live. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. Oh, you are dismissed.